Well, hello and welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams. You're here for another jam-packed, action-filled information overload on this 30th day of May, 2019. And you know what? It's really nice that we finally have some good weather out there. Uh, I'm not going to give you a Joe Bastardi weather update. As a matter of fact, I haven't even watched uh, Joe Bastardi in a while. I have to kind of get back into that. I've been a little busy. Uh, I've been busy trying to piece together the uh, Mueller report. And I think it's going to be important for us to actually start off by going back a little bit in history. Now, I'm not going to go back to the very beginning like I did a couple of years ago, uh, where literally we went back to the beginning. Uh, we did an eight-part series on how we got into the Middle East. But we're not going to go there today, but we are going to start with a Middle Eastern story, and that is taking us back to 2003. Did Bush lie about Iraq? We're talking about President George W. Bush. And as I maintained at the time that President Bush was going, making decisions based upon what the intelligence community was telling him. And that it wasn't an intentional deception on his part as to whether or not there were weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. The fact remained that that was what the intelligence said and that's what he based his decisions on. Well, here's our Prager University segment uh, titled, Did Bush Lie About Iraq? to pr provide further clarification. I took America to war in Iraq. It was all me. Okay, it was mostly me. I had some help from a clueless President George W. Bush and his neoconservative puppet master, Vice President Dick Cheney. Senior White House fanatics spoon-fed reporters like me cherry-picked intelligence about Iraq's alleged weapons of mass destruction so that America could invade Iraq and seize its oil. None of this is true, but many Americans continue to believe it. People died. It was a war. But President Bush didn't lie us into it. The false narrative that he did is itself a lie and deserves to be at last retired. There was no shortage of mistakes about Iraq, and some of the media's pre-war WMD stories were wrong, including some of mine. But so is the enduring, pernicious accusation that the Bush administration fabricated WMD intelligence to take the country to war. Before the 2003 invasion, President Bush and other senior officials cited the intelligence community's incorrect conclusions about Saddam's WMD capabilities and on occasion went beyond them. But relying on the mistakes of others, completely understandable mistakes given Saddam's horrendous record, and making errors of judgment are not the same as lying. American and European arms control experts, counterterrorism agents, and analysts who studied Iraq and briefed White House officials and journalists were the same people who gave me and my fellow reporters at the New York Times accurate information for years about Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda's growing threat to America. In fact, eight months before 9-11, the Times published a series of articles on that threat a series for which the Times staff, including me, won a Pulitzer Prize. The members of the intelligence community with whom I dealt were overwhelmingly reliable, hardworking, and honest. But they were also human. And in the aftermath of 9-11, they were very wary of ever again underestimating a terrorist threat. There's an enduring myth that policymakers pressured intelligence analysts into altering their estimates to suit the Bush administration's push to war. Yet several thorough bipartisan inquiries found no evidence of such pressure. What they reveal instead is that bad intelligence led to bad policy decisions. The 2005 commission, headed by former Democratic Senator Charles Robb and Republican Judge Lawrence Silberman, called the intelligence community's estimates on Iraq dead wrong. A year earlier, the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence denounced such intelligence failures as the product of groupthink, rooted in a fear of underestimating grave threats to national security in the wake of 9-11. 
Will Toby, a former deputy administrator for the National Nuclear Security Administration, still fumes about the failure to see problems in the CIA's intelligence that supported Secretary of State Colin Powell's pre-war speech at the United Nations about Iraq's WMD. Based partly on the CIA's assurances of strong evidence for each claim, Mr. Powell was persuaded that the case against Saddam was, in his words, rock solid. Why wouldn't he? Over the previous 15 years, none of the congressional committees routinely briefed on Iraq's WMD assessments expressed concern about bias or error. The decision to go to war in Iraq received broad support in Congress from both Republicans and Democrats, and again, for good reason. Even if the intelligence community overestimated Saddam Hussein's WMD capability, it didn't create it out of thin air. Saddam had used chemical weapons on his own people, killing thousands. He had invaded his neighbors repeatedly. No, President Bush did not take America into a war because he was strong-armed by a neoconservative cabal. As President Bush himself famously asserted, he was the decider. And no, he didn't go to war for oil. If we wanted Saddam's oil, we could have bought it. President Bush's decision to go to war was based on the information that he and his team relied on, information that was collected by the world's top agents and analyzed by the world's top analysts, including the intelligence agencies of France, Germany, and Russia, countries whose leaders did not support going to war. But they all agreed on one thing. Saddam had and was continuing to develop WMD. Our intelligence professionals and those of major European countries overestimated Saddam's capabilities. Mistakes like that filter through the system, from the White House to Congress to journalists to the public. And those mistakes impact policy. But here's the key thing to remember. They were mistakes, not lies. I'm Judith Miller, contributing editor of City Journal for Prager Unit. So now we've heard for the last 16 years, Bush lied, people died. That's what we've heard. That's been the narrative. So now let's take a closer look about who some of the intelligence people were. I've got one person in particular, and we're going to be discuss because he's really newsworthy right now, and we are going to discuss him a little bit more in depthly, and that is former FBI director, not James Comey, but Bob Mueller, who also headed the special investigation into Russian collusion in the 2016 election. So two years ago, this man was appointed. He is the one, it was two and a half years ago now, he is the one who was charged with investigating. Now, we didn't play this clip at the time, and perhaps we should have, but on the other hand, perhaps it's now is the right time to actually bring it out. We're going to take a look now about, uh, from Bloomberg, why Robert Mueller is the perfect man for the job. Again, two and a half years ago. Because now that his investigation is wrapped up, We'll see if he was the perfect man for the job. So let's take a look at the Bloomberg Report. Dark blazer, white shirt, red or blue pattern tie. This is the unchanging uniform of one of Washington's most respected insiders and the Justice Department's pick to lead the investigation into Russia's interference in the 2016 election. The choice of Robert Mueller for special counsel has been met with unusual universal praise from both sides of the aisle. I think he's a person of great integrity. He'll be above politics. You will not push him around. Completely uh, unimpeachable in all respects. He will investigate the matter and follow the facts wherever they may lead. From decorated war hero to crusading prosecutor to unyielding FBI director, this is how Robert Mueller came to be considered the least biased man in America. Robert Swan Mueller III grew up in Philadelphia and attended high school at the prestigious St. Paul's School. There, he captained the lacrosse, soccer, and hockey teams. 
Muller attended Princeton, where he majored in politics before receiving a master's from NYU. The death of a former Princeton lacrosse teammate in Vietnam drove Muller to join the Marine Corps. In Vietnam, he commanded a rifle platoon, receiving a number of decorations, including the Purple Heart. It wasn't the Army or the Navy, he was a Marine. You know, the toughest, most hardcore of the armed forces. That's Greg Farrell. I'm a reporter for legal affairs and regulatory issues at Bloomberg. After getting his law degree from the University of Virginia, Mueller rose quickly through the ranks as a federal prosecutor. As chief of the Justice Department's criminal division, Mueller oversaw several high-profile cases, including Panama dictator Manuel Noriega, mafia boss John Gotti, and the Lockerbie bombing. Mueller had a quick stint in private practice, but it wasn't for him. He quit his job as a very highly paid white shoe law firm partner to prosecute homicide cases in the nation's capital. That's the dedication that you could see there. In 2001, President Bush appointed Mueller to FBI director. He is a bit of a, a taskmaster. He wanted to upgrade the quality of the office, and he did. It wasn't pleasant for everyone who was there, but it was something that needed to be done. The FBI changed markedly under his leadership. Exactly one week after starting in 2001, the September 11th attacks happened. A lot of people viewed him as being a very steady hand after the 9-11 attacks. That's Chris Strome, Bloomberg National Security Reporter. Reshaping the FBI to become a counterterrorism agency and also building up a cybersecurity. And at the end of Mueller's 10-year tenure, President Obama moved for a special two-year extension. Both times Mueller was nominated to run the FBI, he was unanimously approved by Congress. It was not all smooth sailing, though. Mueller's principles were put to a significant test in 2004 over President Bush's warrantless surveillance program secretly launched after September 11th. The secret surveillance program needed to be reauthorized by the Attorney General, who at that time was John Ashcroft. And Ashcroft was sick in the hospital. On the night of March 10th, 2004, several high-profile White House officials were on their way to pressure Ashcroft to sign papers extending the program when Ashcroft's wife intervened. She reached out to Deputy Attorney General James Comey. I hung up, called Director Mueller, and told him what was happening. He said, I'll meet you at the hospital right now. In a showdown at George Washington Hospital, Mueller and Comey stood side by side to prevent officials from the Bush administration from trying to force Ashcroft to reauthorize the program while laying in his hospital bed. Threatening to resign, Mueller and Comey were able to get the program altered. The secret program most likely wouldn't have come out of the shadows if Mueller and Comey didn't uh, take a stand against it. Mueller's long-standing relationship with Comey has led to questions about whether he can remain impartial in his current investigation. It's clear from his almost 40 years of public service that Mueller is dedicated to the job. He'd have to be pretty much a dead-ender to not believe Bob Mueller. And while investigating allegations of collusion between Trump and Russia may be his toughest case yet. I can't think of anybody who would be better than Mueller to do the investigation. He's had a history of standing up to power. He's, he's had a history of standing up to president. It's one of the most important jobs of his life. And once again, he's answering a call to duty. And so there you have it. That is an introduction to Mueller. Did you notice who he's tied to the hip with? That's James Comey. Mueller and Comey, Mueller and Comey, Mueller and Comey. We have heard these two people synonymously for the last two decades. Mueller and Comey, Mueller and Comey, Mueller and Comey. It's the Mueller and Comey show. And this investigation into Russian collusion in 2016 was the same thing. The Mueller and Comey show, the Mueller and Comey show. WMDs in Iraq, bad intelligence, Mueller and Comey. Do you see the connection yet? Bush lied, people died, Mueller and Comey. Mueller and Comey. They joined at the hip. So why do we take them serious? Why? Um, Mueller, and I've actually had, I actually had uh, somebody on uh, one of the Facebook uh, discussions. It was not on my personal Facebook page. I think it was like on Yahoo News or The Hill. Uh, who was proclaiming, oh, because Bob Mueller's a war hero because he has a bronze star and a purple heart, we need to listen to him. Well, John McCain was a war hero who was a POW in Vietnam. However, the war hero 
Bronze Star Purple Heart only serves the narrative when they feel they need to defend a guy like a Bob Mueller or a John McCain. I've known many people, as an Iraq war veteran, I've known many, many people who have come home and have not honored their service. That they have disgraced the very uniform that they wore from their personal conduct. That if I had my way, which I didn't, I would love to just rip those medals right off the chest. There are people who do that. John Kerry is definitely one of them. But John Kerry is a different kind of stupid. John Kerry willfully, as a PR stunt, threw his medals over, I think, the White House fence when he first came home from Iraq. And then he joined uh, Veterans for Peace or Vietnam Veterans Against the War, one of those organizations, before he started his political career. John Kerry. Yes, John Kerry. No, I said John Kerry. So my producer's saying I said Jim. No, I did not say Jim because I never say Jim when I mean John Kerry. I mean, the, the John F. Kerry in my mind is, is tied. I, I don't make that slip. I know that. But nonetheless, John Kerry is a special kind of stupid because he... I, I, I'm going to give him a little more credit than that. I'm not going to say special kind of stupid. I, I have to actually retract that. I'm not a fan of John Kerry, never have been. But I have to at least say one thing about John Kerry. That if he's going to disgrace the uniform, he's going to do it intentionally and go all out. That's kind of the way I look at it. Before he became a senator, he had already disgraced the uniform. And that was his choice. But hiding behind a bronze star and the purple heart is a cop-out because there are many, many, many people who do, and ma many of them who do disgrace their uniform actually do it unintentionally, unlike John Kerry. I guess that's kind of why I said he was a special kind of stupid. But nonetheless, the fact is Mueller served admirably in Vietnam. I have to commend him for that. His service in Vietnam was wonderful. Great job. Director Mueller. But once you got out of Vietnam and back into private life, and once you started working for the FBI, and once you got to that high level, that's when you started disgracing the very uniform that you had put on. WMDs in Iraq, faulty intelligence, and either you were somebody who had helped write the report, I don't have any evidence that you were or were not, but I definitely know that you were an enabler for passing on bad intelligence to the White House and to the American people. And here's how I can say that. February 11th, 2003, you sat in front of a Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. You, Bob Mueller, FBI Director. And you were the one, in your testimony, who had said that although the most serious terrorist threat is some non-state actors, we remain vigilant against the potential threat posed by state sponsors of terrorism. And then went on to talk about Iraq's WMDs. You did that. Bush lied, people died. No, Bush didn't lie. Bob Mueller, you lied. Flat out, you lied, Bob Mueller. We are going to actually play you now and, and bear... Be, you know, first of all, go back into thinking where, what your life was like in 2003, two years removed from, or a year and a half removed from the September 11th, 2001 attacks. I can tell you actually where I was. I was actually watching this at my uh, dorm room at Fort Meade, Maryland, home of National Security Agency. I was there for a school at the Defense Information School, not part of NSA. And as an Air Force member, I was clued into what was going on. I watched the um, Colin Powell, uh, who was the Secretary of State at the time, I watched his statement. I watched the Bob Mueller testimony before the Select Committee on Intelligence. I watched this in 2003. I bought into it. I believed it. I believed what Bob Mueller was telling me in 2003. I use that as justification to tell my friends that we need to go into Iraq. 
I, I did. But now today, I don't know what to believe anymore because Bob Mueller was lying to me and Bob Mueller was lying to you. Now, keep that in mind when you watch this. This was him as FBI director, part of the intelligence community. Here's what he had to say in February of 2003 about the uh, war on terrorism and the state of our security in front of the U.S. Senate. It's an excellent standard and a marvelous precedent. Uh, Director Mueller. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As we enter the second year of the global war on terrorism, the United States and its allies have inflicted a series of significant defeats on al-Qaeda and its terrorist networks, both here at home and abroad. The terrorist enemy, however, is far from defeated. Although our country's ultimate victory is not in doubt, we face a long war whose end is difficult to foresee. Accordingly, the prevention of another terrorist attack remains the FBI's top priority. The Bureau's efforts to identify and dismantle terrorist networks have yielded successes over the past 17 months. We have charged 197 suspected terrorists with crimes, 99 of whom have been convicted to date. We have also facilitated the deportation of numerous individuals with suspected links to terrorist groups. Moreover, our efforts have damaged terrorist networks and disrupted terrorist-related activities across the country. In Portland, in Buffalo, in Seattle, in Detroit, in Chicago, and in Florida, to name but a few. Furthermore, we have successfully disrupted the sources of terrorist financing, including freezing $113 million from 62 organizations and conducting 70 investigations, 23 of which have resulted in convictions. But despite these successes, the nature of the terrorist threat facing our country today is exceptionally complex. International terrorists and their state sponsors have emerged as the primary threat to our security after decades in which the activities of domestic terrorist groups were a more imminent threat. And Al -Qaeda, uh, the Al Qaeda terrorist network is clearly the most urgent threat to U.S. interests. The evidence linking Al Qaeda to the attacks of September 11th is clear and irrefutable. And our investigation of the events leading up to 9 11 has given rise to important insights into terrorist tactics and tradecraft, tradecraft which will prove invaluable as we work to prevent the next attack. There is no question, though, that Al Qaeda and other terrorist networks have proven adept <coughs> at defending their organization <coughs> from U.S. and international law enforcement efforts. As these terrorist organizations evolve and change their tactics, we too must be prepared to evolve. Accordingly, the FBI is undergoing uh, substantial changes, including the incorporation of an enhanced intelligence function that will allow us to meet these terrorist threats. I'd like to briefly outline these changes, but first, Mr. Chairman, I would like to address the most significant threats facing this country today. And we start with the Al Qaeda uh, threat. The Al Qaeda network will remain for the foreseeable future the most immediate and serious threat facing this country. Al Qaeda is the most lethal of the groups associated with the Sunni and jihadist cause, but it does not operate in a vacuum. Many of the groups committed to international jihad offer Al Qaeda varying degrees of support. FBI inv investigations have <coughs> revealed Islamic militants in the United States. We strongly suspect that several hundred of these extremists are linked to Al Qaeda. The focus of their activity centers primarily on fundraising, recruitment, and training. Their support structure, however, is sufficiently well developed that one or more groups could be mobilized by, by Al Qaeda to carry out operations in the United States homeland. Despite the progress the United States has made in disrupting the Al Qaeda network overseas and within our own country, the organization maintains the ability and the intent to inflict significant casualties in the United States with little warning. Our greatest threat is from Al Qaeda cells in the United States that we have not yet been able to identify. Finding and rooting out Al Qaeda members once they have entered the United States and have had time to establish themselves as our most serious intelligence 
and law enforcement challenge. But in addition to threat from single individuals sympathetic or affiliated with Al Qaeda, acting without external support or surrounding conspiracies is increasing. Al Qaeda's successful attacks on September 11th suggest the organization could employ similar operational strategies in carrying out any future attack in the United States, including those cell, cell members who avoid drawing attention to themselves and minimize contact with militant Islamic groups in the United States. They will also maintain, as we have found in the past, strict operational and communications security. We must not assume, however, that Al Qaeda will rely only on tried and true methods of attack. As attractive as, large, as a large-scale attack that produces mass casualties would be for Al Qaeda, and as important as such an attack is to its credibility amongst its supporters and its sympathizers, target vulnerability and the likelihood of success are increasingly important to the weakened organization. Indeed, the types of recent smaller-scale operations Al Qaeda has directed and aided against a wide array of Western targets outside the United States could readily be reproduced within the United States. Tell you, Mr. Chairman, my greatest concern is that our enemies are trying to acquire a dangerous new capabilities with which to harm Americans. Terrorists worldwide have ready access to information on chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear weapons via uh, the Internet. Acquisition of such weapons would be a huge more. Okay, stop right there. My greatest concern, Mr. Chairman, is that our enemies are trying to acquire dangerous new capabilities with which to harm Americans. Terrorists worldwide have ready access to information on chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear, or seaburn, weapons via the Internet. Acquisition of such weapons would be a huge morale boost for those seeking our destruction while engendering widespread fear among Americans and our allies. So in other words, here is fear. This is a concern. Our enemies are trying to do this. Chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear weapons. 16 years ago, this is the fear. Was that fear founded upon some solid evidence? You be the judge on this one. I mean, I can definitely say that, you know, having, yeah, as a historian, trying to look at the future and seeing where we're at and how things are going, that there's obviously something that we don't know. So I will give Mueller the benefit of the doubt to a certain extent right here. But 16 years, was that the greatest concern? You be the judge. And then I'm going to read the next sentence because I've got his testimony uh, right here in front of me. As we think about where the next attack might come, Al-Qaeda will probably continue to favor spectacular attacks that meet several criteria. Uh, high symbolic value, mass casualty, severe damage to the U.S. economy, maximum psychological trauma. Based on Al-Qaeda's previous pattern, the organization may attempt to destroy objectives it has targeted in the past. This is FBI Director Bob Mueller, February 11, 2003. Let's continue and watch more of this. Morale boost for those seeking our destruction while engendering widespread fear among Americans and amongst our allies. Although the most serious terrorist threat is from non-state actors, we remain vigilant against the potential threat posed by state sponsors of terrorism. <coughs> Seven countries designated as state sponsors of terrorism, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Sudan, Libya, Cuba, and North Korea, remain active in the United States and continue to support terrorist groups that have targeted Americans. As uh, Director Tenet has pointed out, Secretary Powell presented evidence last week that Baghdad has failed to disarm its weapons of mass destruction, willfully attempting to evade and deceive the international community. Our particular concern is that Saddam Hussein may supply terrorists with biological, chemical, or radiological material. Let me turn, if I could, uh, Mr. Chairman, to uh, some of the changes. There you have it. Let me uh, take a look here. As we have previously briefed this committee, Iraq's WMD program poses a clear threat to our national security. 
Iraq's WMD program poses a clear threat to our national security. Coming from the FBI director February 11, 2003. I hope I don't need to repeat that again. A threat that will certainly increase the event of a future military action against Iraq. Did Bush lie or did Mueller lie? I am going to repeat that again. Iraq's WMD, pro, uh, WMD program poses a clear threat to our national security, a threat that will certainly increase in the event of future military action against Iraq. Baghdad has the capability and, we presume, the will to use biological, chemical, or radiological weapons against U.S. domestic targets in the event of a U.S. invasion. Now, I'm going to actually... His, his written testimony, which is in the congressional record, actually varies a little bit with his uh, oral testimony, and I don't think he, uh, he brought this up. We are also concerned about terrorist organizations with direct ties to Iraq, such as the Iranian dissident group uh, Mujahideen uh, El Kalk and the Palestinian Abu Nidal organization. I will repeat it yet again because I want you to get this in your head as it's getting into mine. As we have previously briefed this committee, Iraq's WMD program poses a clear threat to our national security, a threat that will certainly increase in the event of future military action against Iraq. Baghdad has the capability and, we presume, the will to use biological, chemical, or radiological weapons against U.S. domestic targets in the event of a U.S. invasion. We are also concerned about terrorist organizations with direct ties to Iraq. FBI Director Robert Mueller. Mueller lied, people died. That should be the narrative. Mueller lied, people died. All right, let's go and hear back from more about the, uh, from the FBI Director, February 11, 2003. Changes that uh, we've brought about within the Bureau in the, last, in the last year. For nearly a century, the FBI has earned a well-deserved reputation as one of the world's premier law enforcement agencies. And for decades, the FBI has remained flexible in addressing the threats facing the nation at any given time, whether it be gangsters, civil rights violations, racketeering, organized crime, espionage, and of course, terrorism. And since September 11, 2001, the men and women of the FBI have recognized the need for change and have embraced it. And assure this committee and the American people that just as the FBI earned its reputation, as a world-class law enforcement agency, so is it committed to becoming a world-class intelligence agency. As evidence of that commitment, Mr. Chairman, I would like to spend a moment outlining, outlining some of the specific steps we have taken to address the terrorist threats facing the United States today. To effectively wage this war against terror, we have augmented our counterterrorism resources and are making organizational enhancements to focus our priorities. On top of the resource commitment to counterterrorism we made between 1993 and 2001, we have received additional resources from Congress. We have, we have as well shifted internal resources to increase our total staffing levels for counterterrorism uh, by 36 <coughs> percent. Much of this increase has gone toward enhancing our analytical cadre. We have implemented a number of initiatives, including creating the College of Analytical Studies, which in conjunction with the CIA is training our new intelligence analysts. We also created a core of reports officers. These officers will be responsible for identifying, identifying, extracting, and collecting intelligence from FBI investigations and sharing that information throughout the FBI and to other law enforcement and intelligence agencies. Okay, right there. Uh, we are funded for 226 intelligence analysts, strategic and tactical at FBI headquarters, and 125 analytical personnel in the field. Implemented a number of initiatives aimed at enhancing training for our analytic workforce, including creating the College of Analytical Studies, which in conjunction with the CIA will begin training our new intelligence analysts this month. 
We've also created a Corps of Reports Officers, entirely new and desperate needed function for the FBI. These officers will be responsible for identifying, extracting, and collecting intelligence from FBI investigations and sharing that information throughout the FBI to other law enforcement and intelligence entities. Now I have a question that he can't answer. Lisa Page, Peter Strzok, what part of this were they involved with? Because we know that they were FBI agents, uh, you know, case agents, special agents assigned to working the Hillary Clinton email scandal and actually had done work on the Mueller investigation. We've covered this previously. It's been out there. I reviewed uh, uh, Peter Strzok's testimony in front of the, uh, of the House uh, committee, what, three times? What part of the FBI in this did, went amok? These officers will be responsible for identifying, extracting, and collecting intelligence from FBI investigations. Does that include an investigation into the Hillary Clinton emails? Uh, enhancing training for analytic workforce. College of Analytical Studies. Did this, you know, in conjunction with the CIA. This is our intelligence agencies. Now, I don't have a problem with intelligence agencies cooperating to look at international threats. I have a problem when you have FBI agents and a system that starts using their offices for political power. And it doesn't matter if that's George W. Bush, Donald Trump, Barack Obama, or uh, Bill Clinton, who, the, who are the targets. I don't want intelligence information gatherers and analysts actually using this for their own power. Hey, you know what? We're the FBI. We're the CIA. We don't like this presidential candidate. We're going to just get rid of him. Those are Stalinist tactics. This is not the Soviet Union in the 1930s. All right, uh, I think we got just a tiny little bit more left. I hope you paused it and didn't, uh, okay. I've taken a number of other actions which we be believe will make the FBI a more flexible, more responsive agency in our war against terrorism. To improve our system for threat warnings, we have established a number of specialized counterterrorism units. These include a threat monitoring unit, which among other things works hand in hand with its CIA counterpart to produce a daily threat matrix. A 24-hour counterterrorism watch to serve as the FBI's focal point for all incoming terrorist threats. Two separate units to analyze terrorist communications and special technologies and applications. Another section devoted entirely to terrorist financing operations a unit to manage document exploitation where the documents come from Afghanistan or Pakistan or elsewhere around the world and other such units. And to protect U.S. citizens abroad, we have expanded our legal attache and liaison presence around the world uh, to 46 offices. Strengthen our cooperation with state and local law enforcement. We are introducing counterterrorism training on a national level. Provide specialized counterterrorism training to 224 agents and training technicians from every field division in the country so that they, in turn, can train an estimated 26,800 federal, state, and local law enforcement officers this year in basic counterterrorism techniques. Just, uh, uh, to further enhance our relationship with state and local agencies, we have expanded the number of joint terrorism task forces from a pre-9-11 number of 35 to, to 66 today. The Joint Terrorism Task Forces partner FBI personnel with hundreds of investigators from various federal, state, and local agencies in field offices across the country and are important force multipliers aiding our fight against terrorism within the United States. The counterterrorism measures I have just described essentially complete the first phase of our intelligence program. We are now beginning the second phase that will focus on expanding and enhancing our ability to collect, analyze, and disseminate intelligence. 
The centerpiece of this effort is the establishment of an Executive Assistant Director for Intelligence who will have direct authority and responsibility for the FBI's National Intelligence Program. Specifically, the Executive Assistant Director for Intelligence will be responsible for ensuring that the FBI has the optimum strategies, structure, and policies in place, first and foremost, for our counterterrorism mission. That person will also oversee the intelligence programs for our counterintelligence, criminal, and our cyber divisions. And lastly, in the field, intelligence units will be established in every office and will function under the authority of the Executive Assistant Director for intelligence. If we are to defeat terrorists and their supporters, a wide range of organizations must work together. I am committed to the closest possible cooperation with the intelligence community and with other government agencies, as well as with state and local agencies, and I should not leave out our counterparts overseas. I strongly support the President's initiative to establish a terrorist threat integration center that will merge and analyze terrorist-related information collect collected uh, do domestically and abroad. Mr. Chairman, let me conclude by saying that the nature of the threats facing the United States homeland continues to evolve. Uh, my complete statement, which has been submitted for the record, emphasizes that we are not ignoring the serious threat from ter terrorist organizations other than al-Qaeda, from domestic homegrown terrorists, and from, and from foreign intelligence services. To successfully continue to address all of these threats, the FBI is committed to remaining flexible enough to adapt our mission and our resources to stay one step ahead of our enemies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to make this statement. So there you have it. That was uh, Robert Mueller's full testimony in front of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence from February 11th, 2003. You heard it from you know, his lips to your ears. Yes, you heard my commentary in the middle. Question is, can we trust our intelligence community? And that is the whole crux of the Mueller investigation. Right after the 2016 election, we heard the intelligence community says this, the intelligence community says this. Russian collusion, Russian collusion, Russian collusion. And as I remind a lot of my Democrat friends, what did Barack Obama do to try to stop Russian collusion in the 2016 election? Did absolutely nothing. It's, you know, President Trump, President-elect Trump, who uh, was responsible. Well, it doesn't make sense. So we spent two years on an investigation, and, and we had already covered the fact that the report was released. Now... Bob Mueller, former FBI director, comes out and says, well, he makes a statement. Pretty much says, read the report. That's what he said. So we're going to actually show you his statement from the other day, uh, complete, unedited, and I'm not even going to give commentary until we're done. So go ahead and play the video. Dedication to your daughter. And I, I think one of the things it points out is look how much not only families are losing when people don't get the right treatment at the right time, but society. Here your daughter had a bright future in front of her. Now she's on disability and struggling in her recovery because an insurance plan denied her. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. Two years ago, the acting attorney general asked me to serve as special counsel and he created the special counsel's office. The appointment order directed the office to investigate Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election. This included investigating any links or coordination between the Russian government and individuals associated with the Trump campaign. Now, I have not spoken publicly during our investigation. I'm speaking out today because our investigation is complete. The Attorney General has made the report on our investigation largely public. We are formally closing the Special Counsel's Office, and as well, I'm resigning from the Department of Justice to return to private life. I'll make a few remarks about the results of our work, but beyond these few remarks, it is important that the Office's written work speak for itself. Let me begin where the appointment order begins, 
and that is interference in the 2016 presidential election. As alleged by the grand jury in an indictment, Russian intelligence officers who were part of the Russian military launched a concerted attack on our political system. The indictment alleges that they used sophisticated cyber techniques to hack into computers and networks used by the Clinton campaign. They stole private information and then released that information through fake online and identities and through the organization WikiLeaks. The releases were designed and timed to interfere with our election and to damage a presidential candidate. And at the same time as the grand jury alleged in a separate indictment, a private Russian entity engaged in a social media operation where Russian citizens posed as Americans in order to influence an, an election. These indictments contain alleg allegations, and we are not co commenting on the guilt or the innocence of any specific defendant. Every defendant is presumed innocent unless and until proven guilty. The indictments allege, and the other activities in our report describe, efforts to interfere in our political system. They needed to be investigated and understood, and that is among the reasons why the Department of Justice established our office. That is also a reason we investigated efforts to obstruct the investigation. The matters we investigated were of paramount importance. It was critical for us to obtain full and accurate information from every person we questioned. When a subject of an investigation obstructs that investigation or lies to investigators, it strikes at the core of their government's effort to find the truth and hold wrongdoers accountable. Let me say a word about the report. The report has two parts, addressing the two main issues we were asked to investigate. The first volume of the report details numerous efforts emanating from Russia to influence the election. This volume includes a discussion of the Trump campaign's response to this activity, as well as our conclusion that there was insufficient evidence to charge a broader conspiracy. And in the second volume, the report describes the results and analysis of our obstruction of justice investigation involving the president. The order appointing me special counsel authorized us to investigate actions that could obstruct the investigation. And we conducted that investigation and we kept the office of the acting attorney general apprised of the progress of our work. And as set forth in the report after that investigation, if we had had confidence that the president clearly did not commit a crime, we would have said so. We did not, however, make a determination as to whether the president did commit a crime. The introduction to the volume two of our report explains that decision. It explains that under long-standing department policy, a president cannot be charged with a federal crime while he is in office. That is unconstitutional. Even if the charge is kept under seal and hidden from public view, that too is prohibited. The special counsel's office is part of the Department of Justice and by regulation, it was bound by that department policy. Charging the president with a crime was therefore not an option we could consider. The department's written opinion explaining the policy makes several important points that further informed our handling of the obstruction investigation. Those points are summarized in our report and I will describe two of them for you. First, the opinion explicitly permits the investigation of a sitting president because it is important to preserve evidence while memories are fresh and documents available. Among other things, that evidence could be used if there were co-conspirators who could be charged now. And second, the opinion says that the Constitution requires a process other than the criminal justice system to formally accuse a sitting president of wrongdoing. And beyond department policy, we were guided by principles of fairness. It would be unfair to potentially 
it would be unfair to potentially accuse somebody of a crime when there can be no court resolution of the actual charge. So that was Justice Department policy. Those were the principles under which we operated. And from them, we concluded that we would, would not reach a determination one way or the other about whether the president committed a crime. That is the office's, that is the office's final position. And we will not comment on any other conclusions or hypotheticals about the president. We conducted an independent criminal investigation and reported the results to the Attorney General, as required by department regulations. The Attorney General then concluded that it was appropriate to provide our report to Congress and to the American people. At one point in time, I requested that certain portions of the report be released. The Attorney General preferred to make, that in, preferred to make the entire report public all at once. And we appreciate that the Attorney General made the report largely public, and I certainly do not question the Attorney General's good faith in that decision. Now, I hope and expect this to be the only time that I will speak to you in this manner. I am making that decision myself. No one has told me whether I can or should testify or speak further about this matter. There has been discussion about an appearance before Congress any testimony from this office would not go beyond our report. It contains our findings and analysis and the reasons for the decisions we made. We chose those words carefully and the work speaks for itself. And the report is my testimony. I would not provide information beyond that which is already public in any appearance before Congress. In addition, access to our underlying work product is being decided in a process that does, that does not involve our office. So beyond what I've said here today and what is contained in our written work, I do not believe it is appropriate for me to speak further about the investigation or to comment on the actions of the Justice Department or Congress. And it's for that reason I will not be taking questions today as well. Now before I step away, I want to thank the attorneys the FBI agents, the analysts, the professional staff who helped us conduct this investigation in a fair and independent manner. These individuals who spent nearly two years with the special counsel's office were of the highest integrity. And I will close by reiterating the central allegation of our indictments that there were multiple systematic efforts to interfere in our election. And that allegation deserves the attention of every American. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. So there you have it. That is uh, Bob Mueller's uh, statement. And I'm going to uh, take a uh, few notes during that. Um, first of all, he brought up longstanding department policy about not indicting a sitting president. And then he makes the claim that is unconstitutional. He makes a declarative statement. However, that has not been overturned by the U.S. Supreme Court. Unless the U.S. Supreme Court deems it unconstitutional, it's constitutional. And so I think he's a little disingenuous to, to make that statement that it's unconstitutional when, of course, the Supreme Court has not been, and I don't know if anybody's ever challenged that. Uh, he does mention that the Constitution requires a process other than criminal justice system when it comes to handling a sitting president. He is correct. And that, I believe, is really the whole emphasis of the reason why he made a public statement. It was that second uh, statement that he made in, in, in second paragraph in that section. The Constitution requires uh, a process other than the criminal justice system in handling matters involving a sitting president. That now signals that it is up to Congress to determine whether or not they are going to impeach President Trump. Pure and simple. That's what it means. Uh, you know, he talks about insufficient evidence on Russian collusion. Essentially, they couldn't prove anything. So that means in the absence of proof, you're innocent, right? Isn't that 
the American system that you're innocent until proven guilty, not the other way around. That it's the prosecutor that has to determine the guilt. And then the second thing is uh, with Department of Justice guidelines, you know, uh, something that happened during Ken Starr's investigation of Bill Clinton. He used the term guilty 11 times in his report against Bill Clinton. This is the special prosecutor in, in, uh, in that investigation. 11 times Ken Starr said he is guilty. What Mueller should have done is said, we reached a conclusion that he is guilty of obstruction regarding Trump, but he did not do that. And so with Starr on one hand making unequivocal statements that Clinton was guilty, and here is the evidence to back that up, that was not done with the Mueller report. Mueller did not say, Trump is guilty, here is the evidence. And what really tells me is that Comey and Mueller, Mueller and Comey, again, that Mueller-Comey show, Mueller-Comey, Mueller-Comey, they're trying to have it both ways. On one hand, they're trying to act like statesmen, that we from the intelligence community know better than everybody else. On the other hand, they're trying to act like prosecutors and their fingerprints are all over this. And I'm not just talking about the Mueller investigation. I'm talking about all of the stuff that led to the uh, fake dossier and all the stuff that we brought up in previous months. So where are we going to go from here? Where, where do we go? We are going to have a state of chaos in the next 14 months. That's really all it is. Go back to a previous vote by the House of Representatives. 60 Democrats have already voted that they want to proceed with impeachment. That's what this is all about. Now the Mueller report is out. Now Mueller has made a statement. And now it's time for Congress to do its job. If Gerald Nadler, Congressman from New York, Chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, wants to take on impeachment, if Nancy Pelosi wants to take on impeachment, they are now free to do so that Mueller's not going to stop them. He has now punted that over to Congress. For the next 14 months, that's all we're going to hear now is the congressional investigation into impeachment, and it wouldn't surprise me if articles of impeachment get drafted and, is, and taken seriously this time. In the meantime, this is all about the 2020 election, which is all it has ever been about going back to 2016 when, when Donald Trump became president-elect. That's all this is, folks. And keep in mind the Democrats even know that they don't have enough votes in the uh, U.S. Senate to actually convict uh, Donald Trump, so they may push impeachment or they just may have it as a threat. So now Mueller is going to go off into retirement, but here's one of the things I think is the reason why he does not want to appear before Congress. He does not want the likes of Jim Jordan or Doug Collins probing. Why were all these Clinton uh, financial backers on his team. Where was the equality there between, you know, pro-Trumpers and pro-Hillary supporters as far as the attorneys on that investigative team? There were none. It was heavily balanced on one side and not the other. And asking questions about the dossier, asking questions about staff decisions, asking questions as to whether or not He's gone into an investigation regarding, you know, Hillary Clinton and Obama. Mueller doesn't want to answer any of that. But see, that's the next step because we know that President Trump is a fighter. We know that. And so Attorney General Barr has already said he's going to declassify a lot of the investigative reports, the underlying documents that led to the Mueller report. They're going to start now investigating the investigators. And Mueller, I think, is trying to, and I have to give Mueller some credit here, I think he's kind of saying, you know, I don't have anything here, but I also know that I still have to give something here. And he's, try, he's all, really trying to find both ways there. He's trying to find a happy medium. He's not going to get it. It's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. But now the Mueller report is over. For Dallas Pearson producer, I'm your host, Jeff Williams. Thanks for watching North Star Oasis.